We actually generally would only have one keynote speaker, but his story was so compelling for a couple of different reasons. Um, a, he's from New Orleans, and New Orleans, as you guys know, about 10 years ago, suffered one of the worst disasters we've ever seen in this country, much less worldwide. And what the city went through, and all of us that were outside of the city and experiencing it, was such an effect. But when you think about what Datto does, and being a disaster recovery company, it kind of only seemed appropriate that we talk about the disaster that actually happened here. Now, we're talking about data protection. It's obviously not as critical as things like what Gerard, uh, excuse me, Jared experienced here uh, in this town. But his message will actually resonate because the, the way in which he was dealing with these disasters, and I've got an introduction, a formal introduction that I will read about him, but the way in which uh, he witnessed this, went through this, and, and worked with these disasters isn't too far off. I mean, the elements are different, but it's not too far off from what we have to do when we're actually compelling your customers, the end users, on what a disaster looks like. What are the ramifications on your business? Because you guys know the best time to sell BDR is only after the disaster has actually happened. So how do you get in front of them? How do you position it properly? And he's got some insight and some knowledge, and the stories just kind of really came together quite nicely for us that it really, really made sense. I actually just recorded a podcast with Jared, and it, uh, we'll put that up if you guys haven't caught. We actually have a regular podcast now. This one will be posted uh, very, very shortly. But really cool insight. And, and translating those two worlds together. So let me, uh, let me get them introduced and let me get them on stage here for you. So in our businesses, protecting the world's data uh, seems like it should always be a logical and smart choice for a company. But why is it that some people resist that or think about it only on those clear, sunny days, not thinking about the darkest days that they're going to have to go through? So our next speaker is a New Orleans native who watched a very similar scenario play out here in New Orleans just 10 years ago through Hurricane Katrina, devastating the city and filling it with muddy flow waters. The hardest part for him was knowing that he had actually warned the city 15 years before the hurricane about how bad the devastation could be, yet the city did little to prepare for that worst case scenario. Jared Bro now works as a crisis communications expert. But prior to that, he was a television journalist. He was a storm chaser. And you may have seen him on, on television programs like CNN, the Weather Channel, and other major news networks. So today, he's going to examine the mindset for those that are resisting protecting themselves. And he's going to show us that even during muddy waters, there's a silver lining. And sometimes those silver linings can be found in the most unlikely of places. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage Jared Bro. It's interesting that we live parallel lives, you in disaster and data recovery, and me watching disasters happen all my life. I, I have just ended up in some most unusual places watching disasters, and now you are in one of those places where the disaster actually happened. So our story actually starts 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Hurricane Katrina hit. So what that means for many of you is that if you're over 30, your memory of this event may not be all that clear because your life was very distracted. So as we look at the story today, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the history of what happened here in town. I'm going to look at what people should have known we're going to examine how communications could have changed everything, how preparing ahead of time could have changed everything. And then after we look at that, we're going to transition, and we're going to look at those silver linings that happened in those muddy waters. The muddy waters were just more than you could actually ever fathom. Imagine an entire city, an entire city, imagine your town, your town flooded completely with water. Imagine every business destroyed. Imagine every home uninhabitable, not just for a short period of time, but for months and months and months. My story started one day when I was chasing a storm. It was actually 1989, a hurricane named Hugo hit South Carolina. And Hurricane Hugo left sailboats in downtown Charleston. And I started thinking, my gosh, if the tidal surge was that high, what would happen to my town? What would happen to New Orleans? 
So after covering the storm in South Carolina, I came home and I called the National Weather Service and I was on the phone with the director at the time, Bob Sheets. And Bob said, New Orleans is our worst case scenario. I said, have you ever verbalized that? Have you ever told anybody that? And he says, no, we just have this brand new data. You guys will appreciate living in a digital world that he sent me to somebody who had a mainframe computer who printed out volumes of maps for me, showing me what the floods would look like. It wasn't anything that we could pull up on a PC because there was no such thing in a television newsroom at the time as a PC. And what these maps showed me scared me to death because I knew the city that I was born and raised in was going to be annihilated one day. So, as you do in TV, Ron Burgundy style, you do a special report for ratings. <laughs> We're going to do a flashback in time here, and I'm going to take you back to the report that I did in 1990, which was 15 years before Hurricane Katrina. And then we'll discuss afterwards what we should have lo learned and what we should have known, but what we didn't learn. Lake Punchatrain is great on a calm day, but when the wind blows and a storm moves in, it kicks up quickly. In many ways, it's like a big bowl filled with water. The wind blows and that water starts to slosh back and forth. And when a hurricane comes, the bowl is literally tipped, spilling all of that water into the city. When the big one comes, that could be our worst nightmare. The worst thing that could happen to the Nine Parish metropolitan area is for a slow-moving level five hurricane to approach from the mouth of the river. It would dump eight to 12 feet of water into areas west of the river. It would dump up to 15 feet of water into areas east of the river and along the north shore. And it would dump up to 20 feet of water into the east bank of St. John, St. Charles, Jefferson, and all of Orleans Parish. In areas with 12 feet of water, one out of every 4,900 people would be killed. 63% of the homes would be damaged, and 47% of all businesses would be damaged. In areas with 15 feet of water, one out of every 850 people who stay behind would be killed. Home damage would reach 63%. Commercial damage would reach 55%. And major evacuation routes would be destroyed. And in areas with 20 feet or more of water, one out of every 100 people not evacuated could be killed. Homes would be totally destroyed, and so would businesses. All of the levees in our area have given many people a false sense of security. The experts say these levees may hold back the tidal surge from a level three hurricane like Betsy. But in a level four or a level five hurricane, the waves would top the levees, flooding everything below. Imagine homes in Metairie looking like this and historic landmarks looking like this. It could happen. Some experts say it would take a minimum of 72 hours to evacuate the entire nine parish metropolitan area. But at 72 hours out, Picking a point of landfall is nearly impossible for hurricane forecasters. Nine out of ten times, if they predict a landfall, they're wrong. For example, if a hurricane is passing between Florida and Cuba, entering the Gulf at 10 miles an hour, it would still be 68 hours away. What do you think the likelihood is of anyone accurately picking a point of impact? You see, it's a problem of time management. If you wait until you know a hurricane is definitely going to hit, it's too late to evacuate everyone. And that is precisely, precisely what happened here in the city of New Orleans. We talked about the nine parish metropolitan area. We have parishes instead of counties. Eight of them did the right thing. Eight of them communicated effectively. Eight of them got their people out of harm's way. Eight of them on clear sunny days prepared for their very worst day. And that's the first parallel to your business. On a sunny day like today, you're trying to help your customers prepare for the danger or the crisis or the scenario that they may face. And some of them are so willing to always do the right thing. And some of them, if you handed them a million dollars, still wouldn't do the right thing. And why is that? And sadly, out of the nine parish metropolitan area, it was the city of New Orleans, the largest of the parishes, the one who needed the most to communicate effectively the need for a, an evacuation, failed to do so. They absolutely failed to do so. 
I had been to so many storms as a chaser, and because I knew this was going to happen, my family was evacuated before the first call ever went out. It's kind of strange when you have to evacuate for a hurricane. You go through the necessary steps. I remember uh, two days before the storm buying plywood, putting up plywood. Some of you I know live in hurricane zones, so you know the routine. You get your power screwdriver and you, you put up the screws. And I remember thinking, and this is the scene where they're gonna do the movie about it, a leaf kind of drifted down on my shoulder as I was putting up the plywood. And I looked over my shoulder and I glanced up and I realized I, I had about 75 large pine trees and oak trees in my yard. And I was thinking, really, is this plywood going to keep those trees from coming through? <laughs> However, like some of you, I survived the Cold War, right? So those of you who are Cold War babies like me, what were you taught? Duck and cover, right? Yeah. So you're taught that you can get under a three inch uh, or a three eighth inch piece of plywood under your desk and actually survive a nuclear blast. So that gave me hope knowing that the plywood would eventually save my home from the trees. Uh, I was very blessed that I didn't live in the flood zone. I just had to watch out for the falling pine trees. But when we left, I, I remember turning to my wife, Cindy, and saying, take a look at the house because we may never see this again. Uh, it's, it's an odd feeling when you're at that point of revelation knowing that the big one is about to hit. And I remember the fear in her face when I told her, pack for 10 days, pack business clothes. We backed up our data and brought it with us. Put all the computers in the car, all the home movies. But I told her, I said, you know, you might have to go get a job. Uh, the kids are going to have to roll in school elsewhere. We may never see this again. Well, we, we were blessed enough to be able to come back. But during that evacuation, I was angry. I was so angry. And it was difficult for me to, I wasn't a good person to be around over those two days because the mayor of New Orleans was not calling evacuations, not doing what he should have decided to do on a clear sunny day. He's one of those guys who decided, we'll just work it out when the time comes. You've got a couple of hundred thousand people that you're responsible for. Working it out is not the right thing to do when the time comes. So here's a paradigm about leadership that I think is going to have some parallel to what you do. What I learned was that some people do their duty and some people are in complete denial. And you see that with your customers and your potential customers. The ones who do their duty are also the ones who take action. The ones who are in denial are always arrogant. The ones who do their duty and take action find that you can get everybody that you affect to be responsible. But it's the ones who are in denial and who are arrogant, they blame everyone else for the failings. And then everyone blames them. So in your world, you've got to develop this relationship with your, your customers and your potential customers to really take them through the scenarios and to assess the vulnerabilities of what might befall them. And not just to look at the obvious things, but to go deep. I'll give you an example. Here in town, uh, back at that time, I had all of my servers in a high-rise office building just a few blocks from here. And it was backed up. It was supposed to have redundancy, backup generators. And two days after the hurricane, my website and my email all crashed. Of course, I couldn't find the company that was managing it, but they, they managed a, a global uh, network. There's no gasoline for the generators. They had contracts for trucks to come in with gasoline. Problem is, in a disaster, National Guard will commandeer any truck coming into the city when they need fuel. So therefore, the backup that was planned never happened, and all the systems crash. So as you work with your customers, I would encourage you to keep this in mind. Who's going to do their duty? Who's going to take their action? Who's going to be responsible? 
And I would also tell you not to get frustrated with the ones who are in denial and the ones who are arrogant and the ones who just won't do what needs to be done. Sometimes you just gotta move on from a customer. Sometimes they're just not the right fit. I used to agonize over that because I help people develop crisis communications plans and I know every community needs one but not everyone is gonna have one. During the days after the storm, I was trouncing through water documenting what happened. It's interesting that just before the storm, the, the week before the storm, I had been commissioned to do a documentary about whether or not our community and our state, Louisiana, whether or not we're prepared for a natural disaster. The answer was no. So I spent weeks traveling throughout the disaster area, and I want to give you a little history for those of you who don't remember exactly what happened, of what this whole area looked like. When you're talking to your customers about how bad something can get, it's almost hard to realize this. That's water in between houses and neighborhoods. You could fly for miles and miles and miles, and there was nothing but complete annihilation. Houses essentially floated away if they didn't crush completely under the pressure of the water. If you look at these trees and look at, at that house right there, what you'll notice is everything stripped off of it, just like when a tornado comes through. This is very close to where the eye of the hurricane came ashore near the mouth of the Mississippi River. And I remember the first day getting down there, stopping, because I saw what appeared to be a path where a tornado had come through. And it was something that I wanted to grab on video. And I shot it, you know, and it's, it's got all the debris hanging high in trees and the shards of cloth and tin wrapped around trees. But as I drove for nearly the next 100 miles, the tornado path never stopped because that tornado path was the eye wall of this hurricane with winds at 120, 130 miles an hour, just completely ripping through everything in its path, creating essentially complete annihilation. New Orleans needed to evacuate, and the mayor failed to communicate that to the people in a timely manner. If the person at the top doesn't exhibit leadership qualities, they may have a leadership title, but if they don't exhibit the qualities, then they're not a leader. And if the mayor isn't too worried about evacuating his family, then why should anyone else be concerned? So what happened, hundreds of thousands of people stayed in their houses, just as my video foretold, 20 feet of water poured right over the 13 and 14 and 15 foot levees. I know there was a lot of news controversy about levees breaking, but there are enough engineers in this room to know that the water comes over the levee, scours out the backside, and eventually the levee is going to give through, and, and that's what I saw. So your tax dollars, for those of you who are from the US, were sadly spent hauling people off of rooftops for weeks on end. The US Coast Guard alone did 34,000 missions to get people off rooftops. So at a time when recovery should have been starting, it couldn't because rescue was still taking place. Remember how I told you sailboats were in downtown Charleston? Well, these are ocean-going fishing boats sitting on a major highway. And they had to cross a levee to get there. That give you an idea of how big it was. This is a barge from the Mississippi River. That little yellow dot that you see there is a school bus crushed underneath it. This is in the neighborhood that you heard a lot about in the news called the Lower Ninth Ward. Can you believe this? The house just floated and landed right there on the highway. The brown hill that you see in the background is one of those levees. You can see the debris, how far up that debris was and how high that water line was. Have you ever seen a house on a concrete slab, a brick house, float? Not only did this one float and land and crash into a neighbor's house, 
when we went through that community, no one could find a missing house. No one knows where this house came from. It wasn't until later in the recovery that someone thought, let's break a window and go see if there are any bills that aren't waterlogged so we can actually see what the address of this house was. And it had floated an insurmountable uh, distance. It was just absolutely bizarre how far it went. Cars on rooftops. It's just astronomical. Every vehicle left behind ended up like that. And then there were the number of houses that just crushed under the weight of the water. And then those of you who have kids. I mean, this doll in the trash is just a perfect example that kind of drives home that there is a human toll that goes along with these incidents. So as you deal with folks, especially when your customers and your clients have experienced a natural disaster, not only do you need to be there as their data friend, you need to support them emotionally. It's going to be a tough time for those people. They're going to have emotional scars that need healing. When we evacuate, we always pack the wedding album first. That's rule number one. Wedding album and home photos, home videos are the first things to go. But so many people left everything behind. And every house had these types of mementos, just completely destroyed everything. One of the humor sides of what happens when a disaster comes, and, and it is important to find the things that you can laugh at, is how much a refrigerator stinks. Now, you guys have been out on the streets of New Orleans, right? It's a little warm out there right now. Mm -hmm. And some of you came in early. You've been down Bourbon Street, and you've smelled what it's like when the seafood restaurants put their garbage cans out on a nice warm summer day. Imagine hundreds of thousands of freezers packed with fish and crabs and crawfish and shrimp with no electricity. We were known as the refrigerator city. It was a horrendous, horrendous smell because everybody down here has not just one refrigerator, but two, and sometimes three, because of course you get the beer refrigerator, right? And then you get your food kitchen refrigerator, and then you have the refrigerator for all of the stuff from uh, your fishing trips. For those of you who are faith bound, since 1985, I've never seen an iconic statue of the Virgin Mary ever knocked over by a hurricane. And down where the eye of the hurricane hit, where it came ashore, this was the only structure, the only structure that was standing in this town. And as you can see, it was washed off of its foundations. Case studies create living classrooms. Every community has to determine how they proceed. You helping your clients is kind of the brick and mortar side of things. It's getting things back on track. It's knowing that something that was there was lost. And in your case, you have the ability to help them find it. Case studies are a great way, I think, to make a sale to a client. To find those examples in life where someone just like them experienced something that was tough, that impacted their business, that impacted their livelihood, that impacted their pocketbook, so that you can be there to present an opportunity for them. Be opportunistic. Look back and find those examples that you can point to that say, we can help you this way. Understand for them what their pain, problem, and predicament is. If you have an answer to their pain, to their problem, and to their predicament, then you're going to be their best friend, right? And ultimately, that's what we want, for you to be there. I will tell you this. Ask them lots of questions. Ask them lots of questions and find out where their fear exists. Sometimes when you live in a technical world, you, you have a tendency to want to overwhelm someone with the technical data and the reasons to do it. 
But what you've seen here was an emotional disaster as well as a physical disaster. And I think when you can make that emotional connection with your clients and your potential clients, you're going to be so much better off, so much better off. So when there's a disaster, you have to make a transition after the disaster to the recovery. And there are two ways that you have to recover. One is with brick and mortar, and one is to recover the heart, soul, and spirit, whether it be of a business, of a family, of a community. So let's take a little bit time to look back at what it takes after a disaster when there are many things in play. We were so blessed that so many institutions immediately came to town. There was one community leader who told me he couldn't believe that as soon as the wind stopped, Canadian Mounted Police showed up in boats to help him. They were wise enough that they started their journey many, many days before FEMA actually started their journey to come down here. But the institutions like the Red Cross were absolutely astounding. One of the things, as we've started coming up on this 10th anniversary, it'll be 10 years on the 29th of August, that my daughter and I decided to do was work together as father and daughter to try to find those iconic moments, those epiphany moments, at which different people and different institutions said, I actually have to come and do something. And I'm going to share these stories with you because in some of your lives, while you're very good at what you do and you're very happy doing it, I want you to keep your life open enough to realize that sometimes you're going to get a calling that you were never expecting. Now, with the Red Cross, the beauty there is people can write a check. And if you've ever written a check to the Red Cross... I'm one of the guys that got it. It is so humbling when your life comes to an end and you have zero cash flow. You can't go to your, to your bank because the bank is underwater and all of your credit cards are useless. No ATM works. And a volunteer from the Red Cross gives you a gift card to buy groceries. And they look at you and they say, this is a gift from the people of America. Man, if you give, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving. Because it means, it means so much to us. It made a difference in my life. And because of what I experienced, there's not a disaster that doesn't go by. I'm writing those checks right away. There were people here in town who looked around and said, somebody has to step up. And a group of them were the most unlikely women, known as women of the storm. The women of the storm were, for the most part, the spouses, the wives, of some of the most successful businessmen in town. Most of them do charity work. They're not necessarily people who go to a nine-to-five job. And they went and marched on Washington, D.C. to try to get the recovery jump started. Where you are today would not be recovered if these ladies had met at a coffee table in someone's kitchen after they walked through the floodwaters to try to make a difference. Churches came to the rescue. It was the churches that cleaned up everyone's house. It was the churches who communicated the need for their members to come down. And then we were lucky enough that we have some of our own favorite sons who were able to be a face for the recovery. Harry Connick Jr. started something called Musician's Village because as a, as a musician who used to play in jazz clubs when he was just a teenager, those clubs that you see up and down Bourbon Street, Harry knew that musicians who live on a Paycheck to paycheck cash life needed help, so he came down. Here's, here are some thoughts from Harry. It's a tragic time for us, and, and I think the more people that can help, the better. But, you know, everybody has to decide for himself, you know, what, what, what their conscience dictates, you know. Everyone has to decide for themselves. What does your conscience dictate when it's time for recovery? 
And that led to a huge building boom. And that led to other celebrities coming down. This is Sandra Bullock standing with the graduating class of Warren Eastern High School. She picked up the phone and called down. She wanted to adopt an orphanage. And there were no orphanages to adopt. So she adopted a high school. Were it not for her, that high school would not have been rebuilt. It was one of the first to reopen because she helped communicate the need. Imagine every school in your town wiped out. And she was the star who came down to do that. I know we've got animal lovers in the room. Imagine how many pets were left behind. Because if you stayed for the hurricane, then you stayed with your pet. And when it was time to crawl with an ax and hack through your plywood and shingle roof to get out, maybe you got your dog or your cat or your pet up there, maybe you didn't. Many of them were swimming on their own, seeking higher ground, but an enormous number of people came down to rescue animals. And I mentioned the people who just find that passion in life, that epiphany moment. Liz McCartney and, and Zach Rosenberg are, I think, two of the finest examples. Liz was actually recognized numerous times by uh, the White House. Uh, she was a CNN hero recognized for her help because she gave up everything, she and Zach, and came down here and started a charity to rebuild homes. So when you deal with your clients after a disaster, realize that it's a multi-level disaster. It's not just bits of data, it's bits of their life. It's bits of their emotion. So let's talk a little bit about emotion as we wrap up here today. Have any of you seen these Mardi Gras beads that we throw around here? Have you experienced some of these? Let me do a quick little example for you. Ready? Catch. It's not spill. He smiled. He smiled. There's a smile coming into the dark light there. As these things come out, people smile. There is something going deep. Oh yeah, oh yeah, going deep. Right there, a pretty lady coming at you. Whoop, not you, sir. I'm so sorry, so sorry. No, 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 I'm gonna go deep, over your head. Normally when I'm in a parade, they do not have the high roof. The question was raised, should we have Mardi Gras? Six months after this hurricane was going to be Mardi Gras. Now, those of you who come in only as tourists for the holiday season think of Mardi Gras as boobs, beer, and Bourbon Street. That's what tourists think of, because that's what you see on CNN. That's what you see on Girls Gone Wild. And the reason people see that is because tourists get drunk on Bourbon Street. Those of us who live here, we're professional drinkers. We don't actually have that type of problem. <laughs> I mean, have you ever noticed when we have our Super Bowl parade, we don't burn anything, right? Nobody riots in the streets. Why? Because from the time that you're a child, you're taught to catch these. We have an attention span. We know that this is where our smiles come from. I always love throwing at the camera lens and seeing how close I can come to it. Oh, that one's going a little wild. All right, here we go. Three. Somebody's going to break something. Who's paying for that? So here's the headline. Should New Orleans celebrate Mardi Gras? And that quote right underneath it to NBC is from me. You gotta rebuild with bricks and mortar and you gotta rebuild your traditions. I made myself the de facto spokesperson. I trained spokespeople for a living, so I made myself the de facto spokesperson because we could not trust the mayor of New Orleans to be the spokesperson for Mardi Gras. He had already demonstrated his inability to lead or to ever say anything intelligent. Thank you. He's now in federal prison. There it again. Here we go. 
<laughs> oh, the stories we could tell. I belong to a crew called the crew of Mid-City. This is my float. I'm one of those jesters. I like to go through life with my own jazz band. I find life is richer when you have your own jazz band. And after the hurricane, that's me standing at the waterline. Our entire city had a bathtub ring. For those of us who live here, Mardi Gras is a 60 mile or 60 block, 60 block long parade. And it's moms and dads on step ladders with their children catching those beads. And the reason we needed to have Mardi Gras, as I told the world in so many interviews, was because those beads create smiles. And we haven't had anything to smile about in a long time. We didn't need to just rebuild with brick and mortar. We needed to rebuild the heart, soul, and spirit of the city. We realized that some of our brothers and sisters would not be home for carnival. But we wanted the city to be ready for them when they could come home from their evacuations. Floats do float. Proved it. We had a warehouse full of them. They all floated. So we brought in crews with power washers to wash the decorations off. If you came here after Katrina, you saw these blue tarpaulins on everyone's roof. Uh, we call it FEMA blue because FEMA gave these to everyone who had a hole in their roof. And that Willy Wonka, well, we recreated that into Mayor Ray Nagan, who had proclaimed that New Orleans will one day be a chocolate city. So we did this in honor of the mayor. The mayor was not happy when the float rolled up, but Mardi Gras is about satire. You know, all great societies make fun of their leaders through their satire, so we rolled down the street with that. There's usually a king and a queen and a royal court and regalia, and actually it happens in this very ballroom for our crew. I know this hotel well. But in lieu of having beautiful ladies, we took the men who are the office of our organization, and we put them to work. Of course, you never want to go out on stage until after all of the guys have gone to the bathroom. We don't want any accidents to happen while you're in your high heels, gentlemen. One of those is me. Here's how ABC News told the story of us trying to bring the city back. I'm Charles Gibson, tonight in New Orleans, where Mardi Gras this year is a tale of two cities. A rare celebration after Katrina, but there are major reminders of what still needs to be done. From ABC News, this is World News Tonight with Elizabeth Vargas and sitting in for Bob Woodruff, Charles Gibson. Good evening from the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, a city that is at a critical juncture. Six months after Katrina, this part of the city looks as if a bomb hit it just yesterday. The view from the air, the view from the ground, makes it obvious that this part of the city is uninhabitable, just as other parts of the city have been healed. Mardi Gras this year is more than a party, it's a milestone. To cancel it would have said New Orleans is closed down. Katrina killed 1,330 people along the Gulf Coast and displaced more than three quarters of a million. That, plus the fact that there's not much money for a party, has resulted in a scaled-down Mardi Gras. But scaled-down or not, it may be more important than ever. On the surface, all the trappings are here. The beads, the drinks, the music, the merriment. Welcome to Mardi Gras. You hear the bass drum and it stirs your blood. And it, uh, it makes you glad you're from here, you know? Is it a party because you sort of have to? It makes us feel good about ourselves because if we can do this, we can do the next thing, which is to continue the rebuilding process. For some, there is a need to be here. The Mid-City Parade crew has 130 participants this year, just half the number of 2005. After Katrina, they found their floats flooded and moldy. They patched them up with what they call FEMA blue tarps and took them back to the parade route. Because this city hasn't had anything to smile about in six months, and I am dying to see smiles and faces today. At the very same time the Mid-City crew was rolling down St. Charles Avenue, oh Trinice Bell was returning to her home in the Lower Ninth Ward for the first time. Yeah. And she is not in a mood to party. People can come for a Mardi Gras day, but for us, it's not, the, it's not a Mardi Gras. It's just a time to come around, basically. When you leave the parade grounds and the bustling French Quarter, you find a very different New Orleans. From the air, much of the city looks much like it did three months ago. 
Jules Montana and his wife Linda lost everything. Mm -mm -mm. Katrina Water. The Montana family has been an integral part of Mardi Gras for generations, but this year, Jules is not marching. I don't have the money, and I don't have the time. I just celebrated the best I can. Maybe just sitting on the porch eating red beans or something, and thanking God, you know, that I'm still alive. Like tens of thousands of others, Jules and Linda have been waiting for a FEMA trailer for more than five months. I can see a nice side refrigerator, a little sofa. Well, the trailer finally arrived three weeks ago, but the Montanas didn't know it. There was no call from FEMA, no key to the trailer. Six months later, and things are still hard all over. The convention center had its first convention last week, which is good news, but Charity Hospital, which has been operating out of here for the past six months, was told they'll have to move. Once again, there's not a hospital to function in. And while the state and federal government wrangle over dollars to repair hospitals, our patients suffer. 10,000 children are enrolled in the city's schools, but last year there were 65,000. Six months later, and half the traffic lights still don't work. Entire neighborhoods lie in ruins, and a quarter of local businesses still closed. So what happens on Wednesday here in New Orleans when all this is over? No, I'm a strong woman, and I'm going to keep going. It'll be back to the painfully slow task of rebuilding. A New Orleans of stark contrast. A New Orleans that is dazzling, but dark. Cacophonous and quiet. Exhilarating and exhausting. Next, we're going to turn to the painful and the puzzling search for the missing. Wasn't well, that a wonderful compare and contrast? If you watch the show Treme, there's a character modeled after Jules. Jules and his father, Tootie Montana, were just amazing guys in Mardi Gras lore. Trying to get people to smile again was an important part. And getting people to come home, the Montana family came home because it was carnival time. I'm going to show you one more news report. This is from CBS. We invited Dave Price, who was the weatherman at the time, to actually ride in the parade because we wanted the media to see the smiles on the faces. And I'll tell you what, for three hours it wasn't just smiles, it was smiles and tears. Let's take a look. The past several days have been really bright moments for the city of New Orleans as people have started to celebrate Mardi Gras and send a message to the rest of the country that life is back and that the people of New Orleans are here to stay. Yesterday, we got a chance to get a taste of everything ourselves. We rode on a float with the Mid-City crew and we were lucky enough to bring our cameras aboard with us. But keep this in mind, there's a rule here. If you ride on a float, it's a city ordinance. You've got to wear a mask. Take a look. Now we're ready for Mardi Gras. I went along with the crew of Mid-City for a Mardi Gras parade truly like no other. How happy are you that Mardi Gras is back? It's wonderful. The first post-Katrina Mardi Gras. The Mid-City neighborhood still looks storm ravaged, but the Mid-City crew and all of the revelers didn't let that stop them. We have to bring the city back. And look at this. There haven't been this much people in the city in a year. It's hard to imagine that six months ago, this town would be celebrating like it is today. But if you look around, there's nothing but life, nothing but exuberance, nothing but celebration and thankfulness on Mardi Gras 2006. People jam the parade route, screaming for the beads, baubles, and trinkets that make up the Mardi Gras tradition. In years past, it may have seemed silly, this year, it's an act of defiance against Katrina's destruction and all the talk that New Orleans would never be the same. And while the mood is unquestionably one of celebration... It's our day to smile! Welcome home, New Orleans! We're back! You can't kill us! You can't keep us down! Reminders of Katrina are everywhere. The parade followed the hurricane evacuation route. The Mid-City crew wrapped each of their floats in the same blue tarps that still drape homes in New Orleans. And many of the signs on the floats were Katrina-related. And signs in the crowd showed frustration as well. 
But for the parade, good feelings most definitely outweigh the bad. Now, in order to understand what Mardi Gras means to New Orleans, you've got to understand, to the people here, this is the World Series, this is the Super Bowl, it's the Stanley Cup, all rolled into one. Mardi Gras has always been ingrained in the New Orleans culture, but this year, it means just that much more. After losing a home, or part of a home, it's a new beginning. It's amazing. It's totally amazing that these many people decided to come on out and make this year's Mardi Gras a celebration once again. It's impossible to measure the suffering the people of New Orleans have endured, but this week, parade by parade, they get to remember what life was like before the storm and what life may once again be. No matter what happened, Katrina, the houses, my house is still gutted out. Nothing is going to keep us from New Orleans. This is home. Now that is joy. We should mention only about 150 members of the 250 person crew were able to ride that float. Some just couldn't make it back to town. But uh, everyone is saying the full crew will be back next year. So as I wrap up my time with you, I think we've seen three levels, right? On one level, there is the disaster. And you're each going to play your role for your clients in whatever disaster exists. There's going to be the rebuilding and the recovery with the heart, but that brick and mortar, you're the ones that they're going to turn to. You're going to be their partners and remember that they're going to be hurting emotionally and they're going to need you. And then always remember that for every tragedy, there's a heart, soul, and spirit that needs recovery. I want to leave you now with just some final pictures of what we had to deal with. This is our love, this is our life, this is our home, Louisiana. This is our day, come what may, this is our home. Again, together we endure. This is our love, this is our life, this is our home, Louisiana. This is our day, come what may. This is our home. Your presence here in our little town is helping us recover. I want to thank you for being part of our silver lining in all of these muddy waters. Thank you for being here.